<laughs> of course, Steve, he wants to go right through one of those beams. Hey, it's going to be miraculous. Yeah, we'll just psh, through. You know, angels don't open doors. They don't. They appear and disappear. Jesus never, had, after he had, had resurrected, he never opened any doors. Just appeared, came through the wall. The only reason they opened the tomb is so they could see that he was gone. He didn't need the stone rolled back. So it, it, anyway, my, uh, my body's going to be changed before my feet leave the ground. Or I'm going to have, I'm going to be screaming because I'm a sissy on having any gravitational change on my stomach. <laughs> anyway, but it's going to be, hey, it's worth living for. It really is. Most, most folks, I'm, I remember back home, one fellow didn't come to church because it rained. He said his windshield wipers weren't working. I wonder if he didn't go to work the next day because of the wipers. <laughs> All kinds of stuff that we as human beings, as we uh, consider what happens in our life as human, where our perspective is going to be changed. You got the right perspective. <laughs> Amen. Because we need to come to him as little children, right? I don't mean crying, but, uh, but having, having faith and trust. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. And, uh, you know, we're getting all kinds of notices. I mean, even, even our compassion services from the, from the church related to relief. I mean, for Sandy, you know, for the hurricane and uh, that had come through. And I feel kind of funny about it because it didn't really touch us. <laughs> I know folks around us. I, I know that happened. And especially up in as I can tell, in New York City, so we do need to pray for them. But let's worship the Lord tonight. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your presence, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, we magnify you. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Praise your wonderful name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We magnify and worship you, Jesus. We praise your wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. I got an interesting phone call. Folks that have been around here for a while heard about my stories from West Virginia where I, down in the mountains, Riverton and that, but I got a, got a call from the pastor's daughter that would have been, Steve would have been two years old, two or three years old. So I'm telling you how long ago it's been. And um, he he would have been that young when we went in the mountains. Riverton is down near a mountain, and uh, we had such a good time. And he, we had a morning service. We, we, the first time we went, went and um, ate off from a hay wagon, two hay wagons loaded with food, and went back and had another service, and went and ate some more, and then went back and had another service. Sec, second time, <laughs> so it was an all day. It was an all day meeting. The second time, we actually uh, went up into one of the state parks, and afterwards they had a uh, they had a really small PA system up there. And I remember preaching from Isaiah 9 and 6 about the Lord. The pastor contacted me later. Now, this is his daughter that's remin reminiscing with us on the phone. And, uh, and afterwards, the pastor contacted me. Three Trinitarian preachers got baptized after that service in the park. Isn't the Lord gracious? It wasn't me. It was God. I mean, they didn't know who it was. But, so the Lord is reaching out to people. In marvelous ways. The pastor's going on to be with the Lord. He uh, passed away just this past year, and they wanted to let us know. We had not had contact, and uh, her mom wanted her to contact us. And Amen. Let's pray for the sick. Uh, we do realize, you have to remember yourself that they that die in the Lord have victory, have final victory over sin. And if we are alive, like Elijah and Enoch, and uh, as they were translated, then the sin is going to disappear when that Spirit of God takes over and changes our body while we're still in this nature. Ever wonder what you're going to be like, Cody? You haven't even thought about it, have you? You do believe in heaven. I'm glad. You believe in hell? Okay. If you don't believe in hell, then you don't really believe in heaven because there is a contrast of that. 
but we have a promise of being able to go to heaven. Amen. So let's pray for those that are sick. This weather is kind of supposed to be good weather over the weekend, starting on Friday. And uh, at least the number of phone calls and, and uh, text messages and emails and so forth will probably calm down now since, since yesterday was election day. And uh, thank God for being part of a democratic society, even though we might not like what's going on. We still aren't, aren't oppressed, and we're very fortunate about that. And we, don't, we didn't have to sneak to church in order that we'd be able to worship God. Amen. So let's pray for those that are sick. Pray for the lost. And uh, pray for yourself that uh, the Lord would keep us. He not only has, he's not only faithful now, but to also keep us until he is soon coming. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord, for your healing power, for your keeping power, Lord Jesus. God, we worship you tonight. We thank you, wonderful Savior, for your presence, Lord. Yes, Jesus, we magnify you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your wonderful name, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Abby and Cody are going to receive the offering tonight. You don't have to take your scarf off. Short sleeves and winter coat. <laughs> Here you go. Share one of those with Abby. Either one of you want to pray? I'll pray. You want to pray? No, that would be Jesus, thank you, Lord, for being able to share back with you, which, which belongs with you, Lord. And God, we ask your blessing upon it. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, hello, faithful few. Not scared off by a little rain. Glad you're here. Um, let me mention to you as well, um, as far as announcements, that uh, if you are planning on going on the hayride, it would greatly help if you would sign up tonight, because I am uh, going to make a decision about how many wagons we have based on what we have tonight. Um, also, um, our family weekend is coming up, and uh, looking forward to that final installment with my sister, and uh, my kids are in crisis because they've really enjoyed family weekends because my sister has tended to bring Sarah along, and they're like, is Aunt Janet ever going to visit again? I said, well, I think she will, <laughs> but we've enjoyed having her, and so we're looking forward to a good time Friday night, 7.30 to 9.30. And on Saturday, uh, 6 to 8. Um, let me make clear, too, again, I'm going to reiterate it many, many times, so forgive me for uh, hearing it uh, numerous times. But for the next two weeks, um, the discipleship class schedule is Saturday, Monday, Tuesday. So the same thing is being taught on Saturday and then the following Monday and Tuesday, all right? And then we have off a Saturday for Thanksgiving, and then we have one final week, which is back to the normal schedule of Monday, Tuesday, Saturday. All right? All righty. So I uh, wanted to mention that to you and uh, have you aware of that. All right. Let me get my uh, technology up and going. And we're there. All right. I'd like to turn our attention to a couple of passages of Scripture and then tell you what I want to talk about tonight. And I uh, hope you all voted la uh, yesterday. And uh, if you didn't, shame on you. All right, I won't say any more, but I'm still going to yell at you for not voting. And uh, it's the one day of the year, or the one day of the season, whichever way you want to look at it, in which we all are kings. We are the ones who hold the power. We are the ones who hold the authority. And uh, you need to exercise it. Um, Deuteron or excuse me, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Let me give you the context real quick of this passage. I'm going to look at just one verse, that verse 21. Uh, Daniel has been brought in before the king, and uh, the wise men have not been able to, tra to, to interpret the meaning of the dream. And so Daniel has asked for time. He's contacted his uh, compatriots, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and asked them to pray. And then he proceeds to pray. And in the midst of this prayer, this is the prayer that he, he prays to God, 
but in the way that it reads, he, he actually, in some senses, speaks to God in the third person as opposed to directly. And uh, in verse 21, he says, describing God, he says, he controls the course of world events. Oh, did I lose it? Man, what's the deal here? My technology is breaking down for me. Thank you, Dad. Are we up? There we go. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. So he controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. Now Daniel, interestingly enough, at this point is early on in his career. This is very, very apparent for Daniel because Daniel... Uh, at the very least, was some minor prince, could have been a major prince, because those were the ones that Nebuchadnezzar would have taken to Babylon when he conquered Jerusalem. And so at the very least, Daniel was in the, the social context of the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. And so he had just seen, literally, a king removed, which was the fulfillment of the prophet Jeremiah's proclamation that it was going to happen, And he had seen Nebuchadnezzar experience what seemed to be the blessings of God. Because Nebuchadnezzar had conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, and now Daniel was serving this obviously, clearly pagan king. Okay? And so that's the context. But what I want you to get a hold of is is there that statement on the part of Daniel. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. Now, there's another passage of Scripture that I'd like to turn your attention to as well to to go along with this. And this is a few years later. Um, This is written by a gentleman named Paul. It's written to uh, the church, which, if history is correct, was a a pretty dominant church, which was a a very good-sized church. Uh, A lot of historians think it was actually several synagogues, Jewish synagogues. Did I lose it again? Man, this is a problem. All right, all right. Hold on, i got one setting I can change here to see if this will uh, change it. If not, we just hit my first problem with using this system, which is never. There we go. Um, and so what happens is, is this, this church is, is, is a church that... Um, I can always blame it on Nick, too, because you just put in a new wireless system, so I can say it's your fault, Nick, right? Am I allowed to do that? <laughs> it actually was given me where I was losing the wireless, so it might be that. I don't know. We'll see. Are we up? So this was a very prominent church. This was a church that was well established. Paul had not been there yet. He had not been to Rome. He'd been to a lot of cities. He'd been to a lot of churches because he'd established those churches. But Rome, he hadn't established. In fact, he'd had no fruit among them. And so this, this letter to the Romans was a very important letter because Paul was introducing himself. But it was also important for the context of what we're talking about because this church lived, operated in the capital of the Roman Empire. It was in Rome itself. Uh, not unlike kind of where we live. You know, it's kind of interesting, friends that I have... Uh, in different parts of the country, you know, we live in the, the, the power corridor of the United States of America. Whether you realize that or not, we are situated between the financial center and the political center of the United States of America. New York to the north, Washington to the south. And so um, our perspective on things is somewhat impacted by living in that context, living in uh, the environment that is produced by that, living in the wealth that is produced by that. Uh, it's kind of expensive to buy things out here. Uh, my in-laws come from Oklahoma, and they're always shocked by how much bread and milk costs. I haven't noticed it, but they do. Um, and, 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 and every other aspect of this. And so in some senses, it's, it's a similar analogy. It's a similar type thing. So Paul, writing to them, gives this instruction. He says, everyone must... Did I lose it again? Nicholas, we got a problem here. It's still up? Oh, I took your name in vain. I'm going to take it all night, Nick. Buckle up. Hold his hand, Renee. He's, he's gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get after him. See, that's what you do. I lose my indicator here. Exactly. That's what I thought. You know what? How many of you got Bibles? Yeah, how many of you got Bibles? Because I'm not going to keep fighting this all night. So if it goes away, I'll try to bring it up, but I'm not going to stop talking, all right? There we go. So in Romans chapter 13, he says, everyone must submit to governing authorities. 
Now, there's an emphasis in the next few verses on this word authority, and I want you to note that. So he says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. And I lost the scripture again. All right, now, let's, let's pause for a moment. And this, this passage of scripture always catches my attention and causes me to smile a little bit. Because as I told you, the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote it. He wrote it to the church at Rome, which was the capital. If history is correct, a few years later... Paul's experience with the Roman Empire contradicts his statement. Because his statement is, the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right. <laughs> well, there's a little problem, Paul. You're about to find out that that isn't always true. Because if history tells us correctly, under a man who was, oh my goodness, a scary man, let's just put it that way, under Nero, Paul dies. And there's some debate over whether he dies the first time he's arrested. In other words, at the end of Acts, he's about to lose his head. And Luke just cuts the story off, doesn't tell us the rest of it. Or whether he, in fact, was released and perhaps made a, a journey out to Spain because he wanted to do that. He wanted to go out to Spain and then got rearrested. But history speaks pretty strongly that at some point, and, and, and most historians, most Pauline scholars place Paul's death under the time of Nero, Paul lost his head to the sword, to Nero. And so, Daniel says, you rule the affairs of the kingdoms of men. You put kings up, and you take kings down. Or you... and, and Paul says, this authority, now he doesn't say it quite as explicitly here, though he does say that, that those in positions of authority have been placed there by God, but his, his general tenor here is talking about authority, not just the office of a king, but, but authority coming from God. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself questions like this? So God actually picked Nero? So God actually put Hitler in authority? He actually placed him there? So we ultimately then, for the deaths of six million Jews, we go back and say, God, that's your fault because you picked the wrong man? Now, I know, it's a rainy night, and I had to have you come and have one that you had to think. So everybody saddle up, we're going to think tonight, all right? This is a real class. Hopefully I don't kick the bucket, Sister Jackie, but I don't even think I've started milking any milk yet. So we'll, we'll worry about the bucket once I got some milk in it, all right? But this, this is a legitimate question. Now, what prompted me to start thinking about this, and I'm going to tell you my title in just a second, which will organize our thoughts as, as we look at the Scripture, um, is... The very interesting response, um, any time within a democracy your candidate wins, you're happy. That's a no-brainer. You won. You got your way. Your opinion carried the day. I mean, in my house, I'm happy when it goes my way. <laughs> okay? So that's a, that's a normal thing. The real question happens is, what happens when it doesn't go your way? Now, I'm not here to ask how many of you are sad tonight and how many of you are glad tonight. That's not the point. I'm not here to talk about politics. But we do have a moment here that allows us to stop and think about a scriptural principle. 
um, that, is, that is made plain by the fact that yesterday we all were kings. We all went to the voting booth. We all decided collectively. And some of us, I would assume, are happy. And some of us, I would assume, are not so happy. I mean, the, the chances, I know it's not a huge crowd, but the chances that all of you voted for President Obama is, is probably not very high. And the chances that all of you voted for the contender Mitt Romney is, is also probably not very high. So there's some diversity sitting here in the pews. Uh, it was interesting. Let me insert here. I had, I had my final class with my, what I call my elder group on Tuesday. And I, I really appreciate it. I think it was your husband, Sister Iris, that that said that one of the things that he valued about this church, which of course predates me, goes before me, but I have continued it, is, the re- is, is that in this church, the pulpit is not used to preach politics. And that's not going to change, folks. Because I have not been called to be a politician. If I'm going to be a politician, I'm going to go be a politician. I'm going to go run for office. I am here to preach the word of God. My identity is first and foremost, and I hope all of you share in this, my identity first and foremost, above any other marker, and I love being an American. I think the United States of America is a great country, but I am not first and foremost a a, a United States citizen. I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a son or a daughter of God. You all can have a different political perspective. You can decide that you like to pay more taxes or less taxes. You can have all kinds of opinions that I don't agree with, but at the end of the day, you are my brother, you are my sister in Christ. Period. End of subject. So the pulpit is a place for the Word of God. Um, and, and so that Brother Allah said he just so appreciated that, that, that there was not the pulpit being used to preach politics. Well, that's not changing. Tonight, I didn't step to the pulpit to preach politics. But what we do have is we have a moment here. We have a moment the day after election. Okay, so we all just, hopefully, if you all were obedient and went and voted. You have a moment where we, we, maybe you stood in long lines. I got lucky, man. I got right in. No problem. Some of you might have had a longer wait. Okay. Um, Where we exercised our civic right and duty. We were the kings for the day. We made the decision. We exercised the authority that is ours, given us by the Constitution. And we chose a person to lead the executive branch of the United States of America. We chose the President of the United States. And, of course, we returned back into office the President who has served us for the last four years. And now he's guaranteed to go out white-haired. He's gray now, and now he's going to go out totally white-haired. By the time it's done, mark my words, watch it, unless he dyes his hair, Sister Jackie, but I don't think he's going to do that because he hasn't already. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan did that, but that's the only one. He came in, died, and probably kept dying it. Um, so we put him back into office, and by definition, if you take the country's numbers, half of us are happy and half of us aren't. This was a really close split election. Half of us are happy, taken collectively, half of us aren't. Now, whether this congregation is representative of that or whether our numbers are a little more skewed, that's neither here nor there. The point is, half of us are happy, half of us aren't so happy. Half of us got what we wanted, half of us didn't. And so what, what caught my attention is last night as things began to get called and then throughout today, it amazed me how many Christians had bad theology. I thought, man, I, I can't fix everybody else in the world, but I can sure make sure the congregation I pastor has good theology. Because they began to make statements that were not based in Scripture. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to examine with you, and I've started it off with these two passages of Scripture, and with some hard questions. I want to examine the sovereignty of God and the choice of humanity. The sovereignty of God and the choice of humanity. Now, I'm not going to fight this, this projection system for a second, but let me, let me give you two definitions. There's a number of ways to define sovereignty, but the one that caught my attention and I think catches the nuance that I think that you need to understand is when defining sovereignty, sovereignty is the supreme, that means there's nothing above it, and independent 
That means it's not tied to something else. It's the supreme and independent power or authority. And then it can be, it can be in a person, it can be in a government, it can be in any number of, of ways. And so tonight we're talking about the sovereignty of God. The supreme and independent power or authority of God. God is sovereign. If you don't believe me, then please explain to me what the psalmist meant when he said in, in Psalms 103 verse 19, the Lord has made the heavens His throne and from there He rules over everything. So allow it to be established tonight. Because you've got Daniel making his statement from his context and his experience. You've got Paul making his statement from his standpoint and his context. And they're in the Word of God. I'm not negating them. And you have the psalmist making a very broad statement, which is the Lord sits in the heavens, He's above it all, and from there He rules over everything. I can't think of another way to state more categorically that God is sovereign. He, ha he has independent and supreme power and authority, period. And it's from that vein that the Apostle Paul makes the statements that he makes. It's from that vein that Daniel makes the statements that he makes. He puts kings up, he takes kings down. And we've got plenty of examples of God operating that way, bringing a king into, in, into place. But what is missing, the bad theology I'm seeing uh, among folks today is the fact that they forget that this supreme and independent being exercised his supreme and independent authority to create a being called humans in his image and after his likeness, and he delegated to us a limited amount of authority called choice. choice. On the best of days, I'm thankful for my choice. On the worst of days, I'm aggravated that God was so stupid to have given such incompetent beings choice. Now, if you think I'm being disrespectful, look at the mess we've made of things. Okay, look at your own life. How many are ready to be honest tonight? Look at the mess you've made of it. I'm not trying to be cruel here, folks. I'm not taking away repentance. I'm not taking away forgiveness. I'm not taking away God's grace and His mercy. Thank God for all that. But look at the mess. Brother Thomas, it, it, it's, it's a mess. I haven't always made right choices. I definitely haven't made the best choices. I've been pretty dumb sometimes. I've been pretty stupid sometimes. Now, you, you decide whether you want to join in on this party or not. I'm not going to apply it to you, but you decide. You already know what I think. So when we talk about the sovereignty of God, in our world, you almost have to immediately begin to also talk about the choice of humanity. Because God does not always overrule the choice of humanity with the sovereignty of himself. And we have scriptural, principle, or scriptural examples of this. It was not God's intent for Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit through disobedience, introduce sin into the world, not just for themselves, but for others, and to have to be removed from the garden and for the created world that God had made perfectly, for it to be broken. That was not God's will. That is not how God would have exercised his sovereign will. That was not God's plan. It was not God's intent. So then why did it happen? Bad theology would say, God is the one, because he rules everything, he's responsible for it. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is that, and, and I've learned this, the more powerful you are, the more you understand that you don't have to always exercise that power. 
the less powerful you are, the more you strut how powerful you are. In other words, you have to prove something. You have to prove something. And you, you can talk about this in a lot of different contexts, but let's just leave it in the place of power or authority. But you could talk about it in the context of education. You could talk about it in the context of money. You could talk about it in the context of, 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 of connection, uh, relationships, things like that. Okay? If people, if, if a being is secure, that being is not motivated, does not exercise that power just because they have it. Let me tell you something about the God that we serve. Our God is supremely secure. He has nothing to prove. He's not out to try to prove himself. He's not out to try to defend himself. He is God. So the first thing that we have to understand is that because God has the sovereignty does not mean he necessarily exercises it. In other words, he doesn't always activate the power. He doesn't necessarily, even with sin, micromanage the affairs of humanity. And I've cited one example, and I could go through many, many more, to show you where the imperfections, you cannot attribute them to a perfect God. You cannot say this was God's perfect will. This was human beings exercising a limited amount of authority that has come from God, namely our ability to choose. We chose in the beginning with sin. By the way, good news, we can also choose now to believe the gospel. And because of our choice to believe the gospel, we can receive the grace of God through the new birth experience, have His Spirit within us, and be saved by His mercy and His grace. But it's our choice. We cannot make a person choose God. Trust me, if I could, I got the force of personality. We would have a packed out church. Because all I'd have to do is get a hold of you. I'd get, I'd get me some really big guys, and I'd just get a hold of you. I'd go find you on the street, throw you to the ground, and make you. I mean, how hard would that be, Sister Jackie? Kick the pail or not kick the pail? Throw it on the ground? We're going to take care of this. You wouldn't have no choice. You're not going to North Carolina ever again. You're staying right here. But see, God does not always exercise His authority. All right. Second thing is, is when someone is supremely in authority, in other words, as the psalmist says, He rules everything. As soon as God gave us choice, as soon as God gave us the ability to choose and in that choice to say no to Him, it means, by definition, everything happens by assent. But it does not mean everything is affirmed. The fact that God allows it doesn't mean God agrees with it. Now, you come to the New Testament. What do we find? I think Renee's happy about this. Nick may not have multiple wives. I think Nick's probably happy about it too, but may not have multiple wives. In the Old Testament, we find that, by and large, they did have multiple wives. God assented. What we know by the New Testament, He did not confirm it was not what he wanted. It was not his design. And the reason I know this, Corey, is when he made a man and he said he shouldn't be alone, he made that first human being say he shouldn't be alone, he didn't make him three wives. He made him one. He said, one will be enough, buddy. Trust me. Don't get stiff on me now. Come on. Have a little sense of humor. One will be enough. Obviously, humanity, sin, all of the other things 
We exercise choice. We started getting into patterns that were not from God. They were not of God. And so we have example after example, and I'm, I'm, for sake of time tonight, I'm not going to go into all of them as well. I'm, I'm trying to paint you a picture of how you can understand and look at the Scripture and realize God clearly has allowed things that He doesn't agree with. In fact, Apostle Paul talks about it. He says the times of this ignorance God winked at. That was his little phrase of saying that God kind of, he put up with it. But it wasn't his intent. And you can't put it back to God and say God owns this. Who then owns it? We do. It's the biggest cop out. Now I understand why the world without the spirit of God, without a relationship with God, why they blame God for stuff we produce. They blame God for famine in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, famine in the world is because we aren't doing what we're supposed to do. There's enough food to feed everybody. We aren't doing what we're supposed to do. And I don't even know if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It's complicated. But we don't get to blame God for that. We do not get to blame God for that. I don't even need to address the global warming issue in order to know from the Scripture that creation groans under the brokenness that you and I, as members of the human race, produced in the created world. That's why Sandy came. God didn't have hurricanes designed into the original creation. For goodness sakes, they didn't even have clothes. They weren't designed to have clothes. I promise you, hurricanes were not in the picture. It's a cop-out when we turn around and say, well, that's God's fault. See, look at that. It's an act of God. The insurance companies love to use that phrase. It's an act of God. It's not an act of God. It's a byproduct of our choice. A lot of times, we Christians, we ask the question, hey God, if you really loved me, you would exercise your supreme authority and you would take care of this issue for me. Well, have you ever thought about that for a moment? Have you ever thought about the ramifications of that? Because sometimes the issue in your life is someone else. And if God actually exercised that of supreme authority, which is His, He has it, and took care of that issue for you, it would then mean harm to someone else. And they may even legitimately deserve it. Now, if your head hurts, not just because the baby's crying, but if your head hurts, Y'all were watching anyway, so, you know, might as well acknowledge it and then move on. If your head's hurting, guess what? It should hurt. Because you are not God. You do not have the ability to rule everything. You don't even have the ability to understand everything. This is why, if you don't have faith in God, you're going to have trouble. You're going to be stupid enough to blame God. You're going to be ignorant enough to blame God. And a Christian can't be there. Now remember, I'm not preaching on Sunday morning here, okay? I'm talking, I'm, I'm not even preaching. I'm trying not to preach. I'm trying to teach. I might be elevating a little too loud. Some of you have had a long day, so my yelling helps you stay awake. So, okay, I'm teaching tonight. You need to have right understanding of God. When I talk about right theology, what is theology? It's understanding of God. It's a study of God. You need to have right understanding of God. Because the Bible tells us He's righteous. That means He's right. The Bible tells us He's just. The Bible tells us He's merciful. The Bible tells us He's compassionate. It doesn't say He is sometimes. He always is. But if I have to understand how all the pieces fit together in order to then say, you know, you're right, God. 
You are righteous. You know, you're right, God. You are just. You know, you're right, God. You are merciful. You know, you are right, God. You're, you're, you're compassionate. That's just crazy. As my two-year-old arguing with me about why it would be a legitimate pursuit to put a screwdriver in that long slot in the wall. Some of you, let me give you a hint. If you have little kids, understand there will come a day when you need to discuss with them. There will come a day when you need to teach them how to think. There will come a day when you need to reason with them. Please don't start that day too soon. It is amazing to me. You don't reason with a two-year-old. You order a two-year-old. No explanation, no argument. There's a reason parents for eons have been saying, because I said so. Because there's no way to explain to a two-year-old what's going to happen when they stick that screwdriver in that long slot in the wall. I mean, you can say all the words, but it's going right over their head. How much bigger do you think the world and the God who rules it. How much bigger the gap between you and I and that God is. God is sovereign. On January 20th, Candace is already excited. Barack Obama is going to have a parade for her. It's her birthday, by the way. She's excited. She's like, Daddy, can we watch the parade? Can we watch the parade? So I don't know. We'll see. Oh, she, she's old enough now to know it's not strictly for her, but hey, it's her birthday. And four years ago, they had one for her then, too. And it was cool. It had lots of bands and lots of music, and it was cool. Ladies and gentlemen, It's possible that God stuck his fingers down in Ohio and tilted the balance and specifically exercised his sovereignty to put Barack Obama in office. But it's not very probable. It's not very probable. You know why the election went the way it did yesterday? Because we humans exercised our limited authority given to us by the sovereign God and we went to the polls and we voted. That simple. Now, if God can raise up a church, preserve that church, and cause that church to eclipse the Roman Empire when Nero is emperor, We'll make it all right with whoever's in office the next four years. Whatever your political persuasion, whatever your personal opinion, we'll be just fine. Because God's pretty awesome. If he could, he didn't, just, he didn't just preserve the church. He caused the church to grow to such an extent that it eclipsed the Roman Empire. Within the next few years, the Roman Empire began to write laws specifically addressing issues of Christians. Because they were becoming a problem. That means they weren't being exterminated. They were growing. See, our problem is, um, my wife said to me yesterday, and I love the United States of America. I think it's the most awesome country. I don't want to live anyplace else. I love this place. But she said, you know, we really do need to get a reality check. This is not the center of the world. And what just happened yesterday is actually not, for most people in the world, the most important thing to have occurred. There are babies who were born yesterday. That was way more important. 
There were loved ones who died yesterday. And not just in the United States of America, but around the world. That was way more important. There were bad things that happened. There were people who were murdered yesterday. That was way more important. There were rapes that occurred. That was way more important. We, we need to get a reality check that we are not the center of the world. And as a Christian, we have a great way to do that. Because we know what the center, the real center of the whole world is. And his name is Jesus. Our lives revolve around that. Or should. If they don't, you got a problem. Your life should revolve around Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. God never promised you that you wouldn't have to go through bad economic times. Where'd you get that? God never promised you that you would always live in the nation that, was the, that straddled the world. No, I, I really hope the United States stays strong. I, I like living in the United States. I like having the power and the influence that our country has. But God never promised that. You can't find that in Scripture. God was as faithful to Daniel in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar as he had been when he was in the court of King, I think it was Zedekiah. Whether it was a Jewish king or a Babylonian king. God works with pagans. Now remember, I'm teaching you tonight so you got good theology. I'm hoping there's some good Christians out there that are listening on the internet or will listen on the internet or watch it on YouTube that might be able to calm down a little bit. Might be able to adjust themselves a little bit so that every four years they don't have euphoria because bad news. Even when you get the guy you want or the lady you want, they disappoint you. They don't do what they promised. At least not totally. They don't succeed. Stop riding the highs and the lows. There's a king who sits on a throne and is absolutely sovereign. And stop having a cow and saying, well, he must have picked this man or picked this woman. I don't know how he could have done that. No! He didn't necessarily pick that one. He might have operated through you. So how'd you vote? If you don't like the product over the next four years, go look in the mirror. Don't yell at God. Go look in the mirror. And be thankful that we don't live in a Roman Empire where we didn't even get to pick who was Caesar. And God was faithful. God was faithful. Because here's what's amazing about the sovereignty of God. God is so powerful that even when humans make choices, He is still able to exercise His will in spite of their choices. I don't know if everybody got what I said there. That's why we, we Christians are the most, should be the most calm and peaceful people you've ever met. Don't buy this garbage that... There's, the gospel is not a political gospel. It's not a social gospel, and it's not a political gospel. Where politics overlap with morality, absolutely, we are called to live in those moral questions according to the scriptures, not according to politics. But that's as far as it goes. Because God's sitting on heaven, and He's so supreme. He goes... You want a Democrat? I can work with a Democrat. I worked with Nebuchadnezzar. No. You want a Republican? I can work with a Republican. I worked with a Persian. You ever read about Ahasuerus? Ahasuerus, if I, if I remember my history correctly, historians think Ahasuerus is identified with a dude named Xerxes. My son is right now re reading Herodotus' history, and, and he, he gives me this proclamation. He says, Dad, I've never seen a guy with more megalomania. Now, for all of you that don't know what megalomania is, it means it's total preoccupation and pride with self. It was all about Xerxes. 
Xerxes was probably the one married to Esther. God exercised his will. Suppose the political system in the United States of America shifts and we get an independent party. Everybody thinks that's the answer, right? We're going to get a third party, whatever that's going to be. Can I break the news to you? It might be a good thing. But we'll probably be disappointed by them too. Nobody's totally happy. We're electing humans. Why are you surprised? <laughs> We're not electing God. God never disappoints us. Because he's the only one who has true sovereignty. Independent, supreme power and authority. That's why we can relax, Christians. That's why we can walk in confidence. You need to exercise your rights. If you live in a country that has voting, you vote. Do the best you can. But you don't get in a hole in a tither. You don't get all worked up. There's a God, the only God, whose name is Jesus, and he's sovereign. He sits in the heavens, and he rules everything. And he's so powerful that the fact that he gave us humans the ability to choose, and we've done a bad job of it, he still says, all things work together for good. In my hands, all things still work together for good. By the way, I didn't read it to you, but it's, it's what comes in Romans chapter 13. Right after Paul says all of that, uh, he, actually it's in, in, um, in Hebrews. He says, all things work together. How do they work together? In a human world, all things don't work together. In a sovereign God's world, they do. You are the son of God. Never give your identity away give your identity away. Christian, you are not, first and foremost, an African-American short woman. You are, first and foremost, a daughter of God. Corey, you are not, first and foremost, a white skinny dude. I'm being funny, okay, folks? You are a son of God. Never, never abdicate. We are not first and foremost anything beyond being a son or a daughter of God. And the reason we can have confidence, the reason we can have peace, that's why Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. A peace that passeth all understanding, that keeps our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, is because God is sovereign. And when the world looks crazy from your perspective when things don't go your way would you chill out because God is running a much larger program than your little 70 years or 80 or 90 or maybe 100 Come on. He's looking a lot bigger. He won't fail you. He says, seek my kingdom first, and I'll take care of every one of your needs and some of your wants. He's sovereign. The reason we have the ability to acknowledge the choice of humanity in the affairs of men is because of the confidence we have in the absolute sovereignty of God. He's so powerful that he's able to give us space to botch it and still work it out. Now stop for a moment. Haven't you found that to be true in your life? Haven't you found him? I mean, how many of you have ever come to the altar and God says, <laughs> you've blown it, I can't fix it. You, you, you've made too big of a mess. I, I just can't handle it. See, we need to stop for a minute. That's not what happens. That's not how it operates. 
Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have to pay for our choices. It doesn't mean that we won't have to take the consequences of our choices. But God has never said, you messed it up too big. Because He's sovereign. He is supreme. There's none above Him. And He's independent. He's not dependent on anybody else. In His power and in His authority. I mean... Part of my problem with this, and, I, and I'm closing, part of my problem with this is I, I'm too much of a history buff. So I, I've read about too many really, really powerful kings and really, really crazy people who've ruled the world. So in American politics, which is kind of what prompted my thoughts of this, remember? In American politics, the worst of our presidents don't approach the crazy factor. They don't even come close. The worst of them. I mean, pick your worst. Either side. I don't care. Pick them. They don't even come into the ballpark of crazy. And God was sovereign then, and he's sovereign now. And he's continuing to do his will and at the end of days, it'll be the end of days because he says it's the end of days. He continues to rule supreme. He continues to rule with justice and fairness and righteousness. He continues to operate in mercy and compassion. He continues to maintain our world. That's why we walk in peace. That's why we walk in confidence. Now, I don't know. It'll be interesting. My taxes might go up. Hope not. I'm definitely below the 250,000. <laughs> For sure. But who knows? <gasps> it's the end of the world. No, I just might have to pay more taxes. Might have to wear a suit for 10 more years. They're buying a new one. Work with you, 30. You still got the one with the bow in the back? Oh, you got rid of it? I mean, seriously. Now, I'm, I'm pretty bothered about the moral stuff. I don't like that we're killing babies. I'll tell you that right now. I don't like that we're killing babies. There's no way I'm with anybody saying that it's not God's intent for a woman to ever be raped. Ever. But a child conceived in rape, if that's a cursed child, then Jesus has cursed children in his lineage. So, I, I don't want to see babies killed. I'm concerned about morality. But let me tell you where we're going to fight that battle. We're not going to fight that in the politics anyway. We're going to fight it in the hearts and the minds of people. Go bear witness to the gospel. Go tell people about Jesus' love for them. Go tell people about the opportunity of repentance and being made right with God through baptism in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of their sins. Go tell them that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit and be transformed in their life. You do that, and we won't have to pass any laws. We don't have to legislate it. What transforms your life? Laws or relationship? Federal government didn't make you a Christian. Federal government didn't figure out a way to make you moral. Federal government didn't teach you all of it. No, no, no. It was the Spirit of God within you. The sovereignty of God and the choice of humanity. Now, I still, I'm telling you, some days I look at God and I go, God, what were you thinking? To give us choice. You're crazy. And that just shows how very lacking I am in actual vision of who he actually is. How powerful he is. How great he is. Because even in the midst of choice and a really botched job of it, he's still doing wonderful things in my life 
and in the lives of people that I know. Anyone who will give him opportunity. So, if when the polls closed yesterday, you were happy, enjoy it. In just a few years, you'll probably be mad. <laughs> That's the beauty of American politics. And if when the polls closed yesterday or whenever you read the newspaper this morning, you were sad, get over it. Go work. You might have more taxes to pay. Get to work. Let's go be Christians. Let's go bear witness. And let's walk in peace. Let's walk in calm. Because the Lord God sits in the heavens and he rules over everything. Just because he let something happen doesn't mean he agreed with it. And if it gets bad enough, good news. If President Obama becomes absolutely horrible, we do have precedence for God taking someone who's a ruler and making them act like a cow for seven years. And by the time the seven years are over, he won't be allowed to be reelected and we'll be good to go. I really seriously doubt, though, that any of our presidents are going to get anywhere in the ballpark of the megalomania of Nebuchadnezzar or Xerxes or Nero or Caligula or any other of the crazy people that history tells us God still was the king of kings. He still was the king over those kings. He was still the Lord over those lords. So put a big smile on your face, Christian, and go tell the world the good news about the God that you serve. Go let them know about the good news that he can transform their lives. Let's stand. Jesus, we worship you. Would you lift your hands and thank him for his word together? Jesus, we love you tonight, Lord. God, you're a good God. You're an awesome God. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that we do have in our nation. God, thank you, Lord, for the blessings on America that you have given us. And Lord, if it be your will, we accept them and we ask for them to continue. But Lord, that is not the basis of our relationship. We are not dependent upon that. Lord, you are supreme. We serve you. We are committed to serve you in good times or bad, whether death or life, whether blessing or cursing. God, we serve you. We are your children and we love you and we worship you and we praise your name. Thank you for your goodness, Jesus. We magnify you and worship your name in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.